It's Tuesday, October 18th, 2022, and this is Talk Commerce. Remember when shopping, marketing, and brand building were all doing digital? Lee Seven and Jeunesse Shaw noticed how little the retail industry had changed in its approach to sales. While the rise of online shopping pushed many brands into the next frontier of marketing and customer service, retail salespeople were still confined to the in-store experience, the sales associates' limited access to resources, and their inability to earn credit for online sales highlighted a huge gap in the retail sales model. This week, we interview Lee Seven, the co-founder of Endear. She gives us insight into the ever-changing market and how Endear is working to bridge this retail gap. Endear is the first and only clienting app certified for Shopify Plus merchants. Its CRM and messaging platform is made especially for retail sales teams and tracks how messages convert into sales, both in-store and online. Indeer empowers retail teams to engage customers over remote channels like email and text, while the app takes care of measuring how outreach is performing, including data points like average order value, location of last purchase, and time to convert. Have you been enjoying your free jokes on these podcasts? Well, let me just tell you that the jokes aren't free. They take time and effort to come up with them. Please go to wherever you download your podcast, such as Apple Podcasts, and rate and review this episode. It will help so much to increase the awareness of talk commerce. Again, wherever you download your podcast, please rate and review it. Thank you. My name is Brent Peterson, and I'm your host. Please remember to subscribe wherever you download your podcasts. And now, talk commerce. Welcome to Talk Commerce. Today I have Lee Seven. She is the co-founder of Endure. And Lee, go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us your day-to-day role and maybe one of your passions in life. Sure. So as you said, I'm the co-founder of Endure. Endure is a CRM designed specifically for consumer brands. So we help brands consolidate all of their data and then empower their salespeople to use that data to develop really high-quality relationships with their customers, primarily over email, text, and of course, face-to-face. In the free time I do have, I also enjoy exercise and baking. Oh, wow. Baking. Good. Are you watching yes. the new series of the Great British Bake Off? I didn't even know it launched. Has it got, is it alive? Is it, can I Yeah, watch? I think there's, there is two episodes out. This is very big news as I go into fall, so thank you for this. Yes, it'll, it'll, it'll be very addictive. Good. And I apologize for cutting you off there. No, not at all. Good. All right. Let's talk about CRMs. And if you wanted to just do a brief overview for people who may not know what a CRM is. Yeah, absolutely. CRM is customer relationship management. So really what that means is when I'm speaking to maybe someone a little bit older or not as familiar with technology, I really describe it as a really high-powered Rolodex. So that's one way to think about it. It's about taking everything you know about a customer and putting it into one consolidated place. What Endear does in terms of taking it a step beyond that is basically we try to give you the insight that data is revealing in the aggregate. For example, specific to consumer brands, those things might be, what is a customer's lifetime spend? What's their average order value? How often are they shopping with you? And these are the things that one of our users would probably try to do on their own just from the raw data that they might have. And we just want to take that work off their plate and give it to them in real time. Users who are familiar with the CRM would ask then, as a retailer, why would I need a CRM? So CRMs are incredibly popular for the B2B world, right? There is no technical or technology salesperson that would spend a day not logging into a CRM. And I think what's changed about retail, especially for the salespeople, is that They used to be able to readily depend on organic foot traffic and therefore not need to do a lot of outbound sales. What came their way was enough to reach their goals and really succeed as a salesperson in a store or atmosphere. But I think what's changed, especially with e-commerce and obviously with the pandemic and just generally with how much is available to consumers these days, 
you do need to stand out. You do need to take matters into your own hands. And that's really what CRMs are there to help a salesperson do. It's about understanding who can I be reaching out to proactively in order to generate a sale, generate a relationship, understand what their needs are, share updates with them. And that all comes from being able to combine the actual data that we've consolidated for you with scalable outreach and tracking. So understanding if I do reach out to this person, how are they responding to that outreach? Are they opening my message? Are they clicking on the products I'm recommending? And I think the insights aspect of Endear is what really keeps people motivated to know that, hey, my my text message actually converted into a sale. Maybe that customer didn't come into the store to do that, but that shouldn't matter. What matters is my efforts led to revenue for the company. From a differentiation standpoint, do you think Endear makes itself from other platforms that are strictly e-commerce? I would say when we think about CRM, omni-channel versus e-com, most of the time, CRM is genuinely lacking on the e-commerce side as well. But for the most part, e-com brands tend to compensate by relying on individual departments stand-ins for CRM. So for marketing teams, a lot of the time, that's their email marketing platform or their SMS marketing platform for support teams that might be their live chat, right? It's everyone that's ever asked them a question over live chat. Maybe there's a customer profile, maybe there's not. And to be honest, for us, CRM is just so much of a low-hanging fruit in the sales world and also the department that is right now least saturated with technology. They have really nothing but the terminal. So we wanted to go where the pain was most heavily felt, and that to us was sales. But I would say CRM in general tends to be more oriented towards B2B salespeople, and that's really where Endear differentiates itself. We are more about the integrations that a consumer brand would need, the KPIs that a consumer brand would need, and the amount of data storage that a consumer brand would need over what a B2B brand or company would need. When I, as a user, come into a retail store and Endear is being used there, is there a way that the user would target me or help understand more about me? It's such after a, checkout? It's a, I get that question. Did you say after checkout? No, during checkout or before during checkout. or whatever. So I if get that question the all the time. And the funniest part is that question assumes something, that you've already decided to walk into a store. And actually, for retail stores, the hardest part is getting you to do that. Stores, for better or worse, actually have an incredibly high conversion rate. They convert about 30% of the people that walk in. The return rate is also dramatically lower than it is on e right? e faces at this point probably near a 40% return rate, whereas stores probably have in the single digits. So, you know, the, what we have to think about is where is the challenge? Is the challenge knowing who a customer is once they walk in? Not really. The store does great. So to us, the real pain point is how do I get you to walk in in the first place? And that's why Endear is so much more about what to do with your downtime, what to do to generate foot traffic or generate converting traffic on your website. And that to us comes from really understanding who your customer is, cultivating that relationship, and then extending that relationship beyond face to remote channels like email and text. Do you leverage social media and allow the users to leverage some of that social media as well to promote that drive to get people into the store? I would say that's something that we've considered and have on our roadmap for later down the line. I think There are incredible conversations going on over Instagram right now where we see Endear coming in most often for social media is we have this really cool feature called stories. And they're basically, depending on your platform, they're completely shoppable. So it basically allows for salespeople to create a custom or completely special story just for one customer, a group of customers, and send it only to them. And that's something that they can share via a simple URL that Endear then tracks for you. So We do allow some flexibility over how you're using some of the assets you're creating within Endear across platforms, but really what we're after is that really high-touch one-to-one conversation. And you're looking for customers to repeat at the store and increase that traffic from their existing base, right? Yes. We are only using the data that a brand already owns, but we're making them do more with it. So the KPIs that we focus on helping a brand improve is, How do I extend lifetime value? How do I increase AOV? How do I increase loyalty? What most of these brands are dealing with right now is incredibly high customer cost of acquisition. And so the only way to compensate beyond just simply trying to reduce that, which I would say you can do by opening a store in the first place, 
is by then increasing the lifetime value. And that's really what Indira is all about. Do you see, so you, you mentioned lifetime value. Do you think that the stores that leverage an online can can mix and match both to get people online and then offline to purchase things as well? Do you see that as part of the puzzle in gaining traffic for the retailer? Yeah, absolutely. There's a very famous stat sort of floating in the ether that opening a store basically increases your e-commerce traffic by about 37%. What a lot of people miss is that they're talking about traffic. So that's an easy number to gauge. I think what our customers want to know is what about actual conversions? And that is really where your salespeople are such a great resource for not just working, as I said, face-to-face, but then motivating customers when they go to buy online to feel more confident about their purchase, to buy more frequently, and also probably decrease the return rate because they really do know what size they are. They know maybe they've actually tried it in store and then only got really convinced to buy it after the fact. But those purchases tend to be a lot stickier than the ones of a customer just shopping on their own. And we've actually seen that in our own data that customers who shop with the help of a salesperson, even online, actually in one case study had a 50% higher AOV than the customers who were going at it alone. Have you seen a difference pre-pandemic to post-pandemic on challenges that retailers are facing in getting people into the store? Obviously, during pandemic, it was impossible to get them into the store. But do you see a switch in how behavior is now we're, as we're going into full opening? I think this sort of ebbs and flows because I think what also happened was every retailer that was a little resistant to change, maybe they started brick and mortar, really had to open e-commerce and had to embrace that as a channel during the pandemic. So if anything, e-commerce has gotten way more competitive because anyone who was resistant before now needed to figure it out. And obviously their first move is to do all the most obvious channels that used to be the reason why e-commerce was so great. You could acquire customers for not much money compared to the cost of opening a store. And I think those two levers have now completely switched. It's become actually dramatically more affordable to open a store these days because landlords had to learn 10-year leases are not going to work. No one's going to sign a 10-year lease. And we saw that a little bit with the pop-up craze. And I think that has found its middle ground of saying, what does a two-year lease look like? Is that better for me? How can I make it more appealing for tenants to come into my physical space? So those costs have dramatically dropped, while the cost of doing business online has actually skyrocketed because everyone's using the same tools Everyone's using the same acquisition strategies, so it's really hard to stand out right now online. Do you see paid and organic traffic coming to a store, be it online or in person? Do you see any way that somebody could jumpstart coming into the store rather than if you just didn't want to do paid ads? Is there an advantage somebody has to do organic? I think Indira is that organic opportunity. We always joke that a marketing team at a omnichannel brand has so much work on their plate, and they are primarily worried about traffic to the site, conversion on the site. And it's just not, if you have 12 stores, right, that means that they can't be focused on making sure every single store is optimized or maximizing their opportunity with traffic. So really what you get is you have this huge database of customers, and the people who are most focused on making sure those customers know about the store is the store team themselves. So giving them the power within Deer to actually do their own local marketing, their own local outreach, they are going to be the most motivated to get those customers in the door. And I think that's really, that's free. You have to pay for a sales force, whether you like it or not, if you're going to open a store. So you might as well maximize their resources to get that ROI on that physical retail. Yesterday, my podcast was about segmentation and uh, and the person that I had on had mentioned Clavio. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot of overlaps from CRM to automated marketing. How do you work with other partners to ensure that you're maximizing if somebody has attentive or something? How do you work in making sure that both are being used effectively? That gets to the whole purpose of CRM. We did an analysis at one point, and I think about 75% of our customers use Clavio, and I think another like 40% also use Attentive. And so what that tells us is, A, there's this thing that we call called the commerce stack. And just to even be a 
proper e-commerce brand, you need about seven different apps because you need your email marketing and or SMS marketing. You need your loyalty. You need your support. You need your on-site pop-ups and engagement. And then you also actually need the OS, the backbone of the whole thing, which is typically Shopify. So with all these different platforms running, they're all really good at what they do individually. The question is, how do you bring them together from a data perspective? And that's really what a CRM is out to solve. It's how do you understand, okay, who is my marketing team touching with Clavio, and who is my sales team reaching out to via Endear? And Endear works to actually consolidate those two things so that you understand who's responding more to one channel or another. And across all these channels, what kind of picture can I get of this customer? What kind of marketing does she respond to? What kind of email does she respond to or text does she respond to? Has she used her loyalty points? How do we get her to use those loyalty points? So all of it is about actually using these apps in tandem. And then, of course, I think right now people are very concerned with their overall spend on technology. And so the next question has to be, how can I consolidate how many of these apps actually have overlapping functionality? And I think that's going to be the really big challenge that comes next for these e-com brands or for these omni-channel brands. How do I really make sure that I'm being most efficient with the tech stack that I've created? Do you see a future in SMS versus email or both? Or I see SMS happening a lot more, but I also see a lot of now spam and SMF. Do you see SMS moving forward in what where it's at, or do you th- see it plateauing soon and people are going to ignore messages in the future? It's going to take, it's not there yet, but it's going to take the same toll as email, which is, Would I ever not answer an email from a friend just because of how much email marketing I get? No, it doesn't stop me from finding the ones that are important. And of course, all of our personal email clients or our phones will help us do some of that filtering automatically. So I think what really it comes down to is what is a brand's email marketing or SMS marketing strategy? I think the challenge there is that is also why empowering a sales force of some sort can be truly needle moving. They will break through the numbness that comes with marketing at some point. I truly know somebody and they are texting me. I want to respond because they likely the content of that message is personalized. It's specific to me. It's content that I care about. And so it's just about everyone will say it, but it really is about personalization. And I think what's cool about focusing on sales rather than marketing is it lets you not worry so much about scale. The whole point is it doesn't have to be all that scalable because you have a huge labor force, you have a huge sales force. So let them just do it properly one-to-one and it will convert really high. And if you have 20 to 50 people doing that, you're going to see incredible results. And as I said, those people work for you anyway. So why not let them cut through the noise? Do you think that the big brands out there that are running retail stores, the challenge is getting people into the stores again? Or what do you see as the biggest challenge facing retail today? I think from a growth perspective, it is probably that you still need to figure out how to drive traffic to your stores if you've made that investment. I think the other challenge is still for a lot of brands, especially the big ones, omni-channel. How do I understand how my online and offline channels are working together? How do I make them work better together? How do I help them be resources and allies to, to each other? Because a lot of the time when we at least launched in there, there was incredible sort of antagonism between what was happening e-commerce and what was happening in store. And they were considered almost rivals. And I think that is one of the biggest mistakes that a brand can make. It's more about how can these two channels support each other? I think there are really great examples of brands that have done that really well with online, with in-store pickup for online purchases making sure you can return something you bought online in a store because A, that drives traffic, and B, that's just logical. Not doing that is going to really annoy your customers. And so for me, it's looking at the strategies that actually unify those things. One of my favorite sites actually does this very cool thing where you can actually search their website by what's available local to you. So you can basically browse the store from their e-commerce site and then just go buy it or go reserve it, which we talk about same day delivery. You don't even need that. You can just walk over and go get it. Looking at somebody like Best Buy, certainly they've now embraced that. It took them a little bit of time to get there, but you can, obviously that features a great way to 
make sure that people see everything, but then go to the right place to get it. The future of, I think it was interesting that Amazon is still opening physical stores today. So it's like online to physical. Do you still see that happening? Do you think there's going to be some strictly e- e-commerce brands that are going to do little pop-up stores to see to see how it works? I think there are different physical presence formats that are right for different kinds of products. And I think what we've really seen over the past couple of years is innovation around what does it mean to have a physical presence, right? It used to be a question of, do I do wholesale or do I do retail, like dedicated retail? And even that's a relatively new concept. So what I love is looking at all these different models for how brands can test what it means to be available in a store, whether it's their own store or these new sort of neighborhood goods is a great example, right? It's not necessarily a wholesale deal. It's more like I'm leasing or renting shelf space rather than an entire store. And so all these different models allow different kinds of companies to really test what makes the most sense for them. And I think the same time that Amazon is opening stores, Warby Parker is still opening tons of stores and actually doubling down on their retail footprint. So I think if anything, it's a sign that physical can work for all different kinds of companies. And it's more about understanding and really testing what makes sense for you and how do you collaborate with other brands so that you are maybe doing a joint effort and you're not taking on the entire cost of a lease for yourself if you happen to be a one type of product or one product business. That's not really going to make sense to just populate an entire store with one product. Yeah, I think if anything, the pandemic reminded us that we do like to go outside every once in a while and visit a store and touch a product and shop around and visit, just get out of the house. Do you do you think that a lot of retailers now are moving towards having something like Endear to help them leverage more of their in-store versus, versus web traffic to promote specific items you talked about the one item thing but is there more of an in in, if you have overstock or understock is there a way is there more of a push to get a lot of that stuff i know there's a lot of target has a ton of extra inventory so they're pushing this inventory online offline is there more of that now coming through on retail yes and i think inventory especially if you're on channel is one of the hardest nuts to crack and it can get very cumbersome and it's very detail oriented very logistics heavy And that, to me, is another reason why stores really do benefit when they have something like Endear because they have those products literally right in front of them. And with Endear, they can know exactly who lives by the store and who would be interested in this product. So being able to, again, be your own best advocate and move product that may even be sold out online, being able to tell an entire neighborhood, hey, that thing that's sold out online is actually available in-store in your size come by and hopefully be the first to get it or I can reserve it for you is an incredibly, a huge value prop to your community, but also a really easy optimization considering all the challenges that brands face with inventory. So it's basically taking advantage again of your human capital to solve a very big logistical challenge. And I think best sellers are always going to move and that's great, but especially if you have those lingering products, being able to target them also without even broadcasting necessarily a huge promotion via a marketing email, potentially sending it to only a handful of VIP customers or a handful of customers who have bought something similar in the past and just extending a promotion to them also helps this long history of the vicious cycle of if I discount, then everyone's going to wait for the discount. But if I don't discount, it's never going to move. So avoiding that major sale and just giving a handful of people maybe, again, like you have a loyalty program for a reason, you know, show your gratitude to those people and give them first access or give them last access to some of these lingering products is a very easy way to really make the most of the inventory you do have. I want to change gears a little bit and talk about entrepreneurship. What motivated you in your young years to start a new CRM? It's a very competitive space. Tell us your journey on Endear and starting that. Yeah, my co-founder, Janesh, and I really got into this space pretty circuitously. It was not a very linear path towards success, but what we landed on was quickly learning that within the physical space in retail, technology was lacking. There was a huge dearth in just any sort of innovation whatsoever. And of course, what we saw was this boom in e-com technology. And it made sense, right? It's already cloud-based. It's already driven by 
fast movers, people who were excited about the future and retail to a lot of people sounded like this very laggard, slow industry that would never adopt anything new. And I think that was one of the biggest misconceptions because if there's huge success in e-com, obviously retail stores are eventually going to have to compete. And so what we saw was this huge white space, especially among the newer, more modern brands who were leaning on physical retail as a new growth channel. And they were so data oriented already. And there were no solutions in the market that sort of looked at what the store was doing as a CRM. I think it would maybe our exposure as solving this problem for our customers, but also ourselves needing a CRM and having a sales team that we realized they were really one and the same. They were all facing the same problems. And I think it's our orientation towards data specifically that really sets us apart in the market because we're just giving our users much more information and ammo to work with compared to just letting them, maybe you just have a messaging platform. That messaging platform is only as good as the content that the users are sharing on it. And so I just think that relying only on something that lets you do SMS is never going to get you the scale or the quality of conversion that something like in Deerwood. That was the biggest lesson is getting to talk to users and understanding how much of their business was already driven by cultivating these relationships, understanding that this behavior already existed. It's just that no one had really hypercharged it. No one had really given it the proper attention from a tech perspective that it deserved. When you started, what was your biggest challenge in getting up off the ground? I would say our biggest challenge was really accepting and being willing to focus on who it was that needed our product most. I think for a while, and I think it's normal to go through this, we would take any customer that would have us and we would do whatever they asked of us. But slowly we realized that there needed to be a very concrete market that we were going after and we needed to use the customer experiences we already had to pinpoint exactly who that customer should be. And I think in almost every conversation with a new founder, every conversation, every interview I give, I talk so much about product market fit because I think it is the hardest part of starting a company is finding the product that satisfies a market. Doesn't worry about how big or how small it is maybe later, but just building something that an entire audience loves is incredibly gratifying and motivating. And being willing to settle on one audience was something that is really hard for founders. Do you think that it's hard to say no to some customers sometime or even say to that customer, you're really not a good fit and maybe you're not going to be successful with us, so why don't you use X We have platform? that problem now. We still can't help ourselves from time to time. It's very tempting when someone wants to use your product and you have to be honest about what it can do for their business or what you're willing to do to meet them halfway. And I think there's a saying basically that most startups die of congestion, not starvation. And I think that's a really good way to think about it, especially where we are in the seed stage. You have to be able to focus and you have to know why you're focused. And I think it's always good to put opportunities on your own radar for investigation and research, but re always remembering your bread and butter customer and why they love you so much because they are the ones that will keep feeding you. I'm going to make a small CRM joke, so I apologize. But when you were looking at how you were going to design gear, did you look at sales for a CRM and think, this 1980s interface is the last thing I'm ever going to want to do, and we're going to make all this great data presentable for people who can actually use it? And if anybody's used Salesforce CRM, they know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I have to be completely honest. I've never seen the Salesforce CRM. I don't know what it looks like. All right. Well, you're I, very lucky. I, I've heard that. I've heard that from so many people. There's like, a, I literally think there's a quote on our website that is basically, we have plenty of users who have tried Salesforce. And to even think about putting a retail worker who's constantly on her feet on Salesforce to use as if she were at a computer all day is absolutely insane. And so we're very honest about the way that we've built the product specifically for someone who works in a retail environment, someone who is able to, they have to be able to look up from their phone, no matter what they were doing and work with a customer and then look back at their phone and know exactly where they are in their workflow and pick it up instantly. It's not no secret that turnover is also incredibly high in retail. 
And so what we think about in terms of how we built the product is, okay, and there needs to be something that the second you hire a salesperson, they can pick it up in 30 minutes. They do not have six months to train on something like Salesforce because they'll probably be gone in six months. So how do we build something that, A, they can get up and running in 30 minutes, and B, actually might get them to stay longer because they love the tech. They love that they can track their own progress. They love they get credit for sales online. So how do we make it a reason for someone to actually stick with your brand because of how great the motivation is through Endear? Do you find it harder to design something that's easy for a millennial to use as compared to somebody who's retired but now has gone back to work and is suddenly in retail? Do you think there's a challenge in both in that sort of learning phase? So one of our first customers, they actually were a beta customer and they are still with us today, like three years later. They got a version of India that we would never want anyone to have to be on. The entire sales course were in like the boomer generation. And I trained every single one of them. Maybe sometimes it took an hour and a half. But what I knew was their willingness to work with me and to get trained and then their ability to use the platform was probably the biggest validation that we were doing something worthwhile because every single one of them got on and said, I absolutely hate technology. I don't know why we have to use this. And yet somehow three years later, here they are still using it and getting even better at it. And they are incredibly productive. So to be honest, millennials are great at tech and it's great that they use Endear and they, I think they love it. I think what's more encouraging is that we have users across all generations and they all see incredible value in, in getting up to speed and actually finding it pretty easy to use at the end of the day. And I can say that I'm old enough to remember when I was working as a waiter that you had to look through a big book to see if this credit card was stolen or not. So it has come a long ways. Another good parallel would be somebody who's a runner and they log all their miles in a physical book and then they mm -hmm. move to a spreadsheet and now they've moved to logging all their miles in Garmin or Strava or something like that. Strava, yeah. So that same sort of pathway for the CRM could be seen through how we're making our lives easier and you don't have to at checkout or at uh, at the POS or even as somebody walks in, there is an opportunity or getting people to walk in, I should say, there's an opportunity to somewhat know the customer and then to leverage that knowledge to help them understand that there's something better. Totally. I tell every founder, if you ever hear of an industry still relying on Google Sheets, that is the billion dollar idea to go after. It's always a sign that there's a problem to be solved. And I know a lot of companies that they are the Google Sheets alternative. They are, as you're saying, the Strava to just logging it in a Google Sheet. Or same for us. Our users went from little black books to, if they were relatively sophisticated, a, a pretty color-coded Google file, and then they found us. The, the typical customer that you would see, or the typical user for Endure, would there be a certain size that would be a right fit? 10 stores, 20 stores? We, when we started, a lot of our customers were smaller. I think it's more of a mindset. Certainly from a traditional ICP, what are your qualifiers? What do you look for? We look for brands that have north of three stores. That's something that we do take into consideration, mostly because it shows a level of bullishness on physical retail and eagerness. To, we look at their tech stack. Do they use platforms that we already integrate with that we, so that we can deliver that really 360 degree view of the customer. But I think what we're really excited about that we're seeing now is if you did start with Endear when you were relatively small, there is no interest in moving to Salesforce because it's just, it doesn't matter how big you are, that product is still not designed for the retail store environment. And so we've seen customers that started in the single digits that are now double and nearing triple digit store fleets. And they are not giving us any signs that they're interested in leaving because we're growing with them. And we are watching their needs change and become more sophisticated at the same time that the product becomes more sophisticated. We obviously hope that trend sticks around, but that's what we've seen so far. I'm doing a terrible job of staying on track here. But if we jump back to entrepreneurship, have you found it harder scaling your tech stack or your people stack? a really good question for my co-founder and our CTO, JP, but I will answer it as best as I can. I would say people 
stack on some level proves to be more slippery in the sense that I think you know what you're getting with tech. And if you don't know, you'll figure it out pretty quickly. And you are even aware of the quote unquote like tech debt that you might be taking on at any given moment. And it's also probably pretty clear to you how to fix it. I think the team growth side is you have all these things that you want to, that you want to do or that you want to think about and finding that balance between hard skills and culture and also equity and making sure that you're finding that diversity in the applicant pool that you're looking at. And then you have to think about, we are a distributed team. Do we always want to be distributed? I think so. What are the drawbacks and what are the advantages of that? And what, if there are drawbacks, how do we compensate for those? So I think there are just a lot more unknowns when you're dealing with humans in general, which is why tech products are really fun to build because you can rely on them. But then you realize like there's a user at the other end of that. And you have to think about how are they going to receive this product? What are they going to want to see from it? So I've just basically bundled your question still back into Endear and the problems that we have on that front. But I, would, I hope I answered it at some level. When Lee wakes up in the morning, what drives her to get up and do something better or stronger, or bolder as the Endear co-founder? Anecdotally and broadly, I would say it's the customers that we work with. So I absolutely adore this space. I love the customers that I work with. I geek out when I see a brand that I recently shopped at or know or just follow on Instagram and I see them wanting to use in gear. And I feel the same way when one of those customers just has an amazing experience or one of their salespeople has an amazing experience. And knowing that, as I said, it goes back to product market fit. You get incredible motivation knowing that, hey, even if something is broken, even if, you know, a, an employee wants to leave, all of that stuff is totally solvable if your customers love your product. And it's totally worth solving if your customers love your product. I wouldn't feel the same way if customers didn't. It's like, why are you even bothering? Like, you have a bigger existential problem if your customers are not huge fans of what you do every day. Do you ever buy something from a store that's using Endear and you want to say, that's my product you're using? Yes, all the to time. The, the person that's selling it? That. <laughs> <laughs> By the I've way, that's my times. product? Yeah, I've done it. I've done it a few times. I also have a very supportive husband who won't walk into a store that doesn't use Endear without trying to pitch them on Endear, which I also appreciate, but I have also stopped doing. It's very cool to walk around a lot of neighborhoods in New York and see the brands that we work with. I walked in and it's just a weird interaction. They're like, oh, that's cool. Thanks. <laughs> but it's not yeah. quite anything. I think it would be pretty weird if a HubSpot person came up to me and was like, I work. No, actually, I'd appreciate it. I'd be like, that's cool. We use HubSpot. So I try to keep my cool when that happens. But I would say the other thing that gets me up in the morning is when I have friends who say, I just got a text from a store using you and I, I saw you in the URL or I could tell it was you guys. And I think that is also incredibly inspiring that we are sort of penetrating all these different circles of people that are receiving our product and most of the time not even knowing it. I started in the Magento world, which is like Shopify, but it's better and it's, you know, I'm, just, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to talk about that, but I can also relate to that. Nobody actually cared at all that I was using Magento to sell stuff or developing on Magento. Anyways, we'll move on. We have a few minutes left. And I promised a free joke. I was going to do it in the beginning, but then I forgot. And now we're, because I'm AD today, I don't know why. So I'm going to tell you a joke. And this is a joke that could be free or we could pay for it. All I want you to do is just react and tell me what you think. Here we go. Two fish swim into a concrete wall. One turns to the other and says, damn. Okay. I'm so gonna that's get, I'm, clearly a free joke. I'm going to say a free joke. I was actually ready I'm, for it to be a different punchline from a different joke. And I was like, maybe this is a different version. So you actually oh, caught, you, tell me yours. Tell me yours. Well, you know, the one where it's like, there are two muffins baking in an oven and one muffin says, damn, it's hot in here. And the other one says, oh my God, a talking muffin. So I thought <laughs> that was going to be the joke, but with two fish. <laughs> How do fish talk underwater? That's my question. I, it's like Aquaman, it does, right? They must use some kind of radar yes. thing. <laughs> yes. And there's that very famous David Foster Wallace speech or short story about what is water. And it's basically like people's aware. It's, 
if you haven't, that's also what's on my mind now, which is it's a much more existential philosophical question. So now I'm just in 10 different places like you. So there you go. All right. I got to do one more since I clearly bombed the first joke. What is the opposite of a croissant? A happy uncle. Okay. Cross ant. Yeah. Anyway, I, get, I, get it. I, I will stop it. torching you on the jokes. <laughs> I appreciate um, them. I get it. I'm with you. If you were to say to a, a retailer the thing that they should be paying attention to as we go into Black Friday, Cyber Monday, what would be that something they should be really looking at now going to quarter four and even into quarter one? That's a great question. I would say, what are you going to do differently from last year? And ask yourself, what did I do last year? And what have I done every year that am I seeing any difference in results? And I think the question becomes, if everyone else is just going to do the same thing anyway, what is the harm in taking a year to try something that I've never done before? And at the end of the day, I'm not a retailer. I only have so many creative ideas that I've seen from the brands that use us. But I think, A, like getting ahead of the most obvious things, like you're going to send a promotional email the week before and then three days before and then the day of your sale. What it doesn't look like that? Just anything but that is my advice at this point, because you can always do that. But is there something more creative you can do either on top of that or instead of that? Because you know everyone's going to do that. And we do have yeah, test. test. We do have an entire webinar from a bunch of other brands speaking about this that I would highly recommend. This doesn't count as my shameless plug. I want to clarify that I would recommend people go listen to if they are looking for inspiration. All right. And we'll put that in the show notes. So we'll make sure you get Thank that you. on the show notes of the podcast. So, Leah, you, as we close out, I give everybody a chance to do a shameless plug. What would you like to plug today? I would like to plug Endear as an app. Is that allowed? Can I just plug the company? Absolutely. Okay, great. Yes. Um, one of the great things about Endear sales process is we offer everyone both. You can get a demo on the app, and then we also include a free training as part of your trial. So I would encourage everyone to, A, go check out the website, endearhq.com. And book a demo because there are no strings attached and you'll even get a free training if you sign up for a 14 day free trial. So that is my shameless plug. Perfect. Lee Seven, co-founder of Endear. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much. Had a great time. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode of Talk Commerce. Please rate this episode wherever you download your podcasts. We are actively looking for people to participate in the free joke project go to talk-commerce.com and sign up for your free spot on the Free Joke Project. If you are a business, I will do a 30-second elevator pitch in the spot to help promote your business. That's talk-commerce.com.